Hi, and welcome back to Channel 11. I'm Ken Shinoda, your host here Wednesday, June 5th. Today's the May review, and it's been quite the month. Good for bonds, good for stocks. It's been a, a pretty um, pleasant month. We had last month talking about Tranquilo, and that's kind of what we've been experiencing with rates coming down and equities doing well. So here you see twos, fives, tens, thirties. We had a kind of a brief sell-off, but a rally to end the month and to continue into, uh, into the summer here in June. We're seeing rates continue to come down across the curve, getting up to almost 5% on the two-year and getting up to about 470-ish uh, at, at its peak in April, and then retesting that low 460s level on the 10-year this last month. Why the rates come down? Where you're starting to see economic data now surprise to the downside. Here's the Bloomberg Economic Surprise Index. You can see it's in pretty negative territory. This may tick up a little bit. Today we had a services-ism data point come out that was surprised to the upside, showing that services spending is still uh, chugging along. And so that, that was some positive news economically. I think you, you did see that ISM, employ, ISM services employment came in sub 50. And I, I think that's why the bond market continues to rally today because that employment component of services is showing that the labor market continues to cool on the services side. Here we see the city surprise index. We've been following this with the 10 year. It's one of the things that led the 10 year up in 2023, you can see a pretty high correlation there. And it's it, along with that Bloomberg Surprise Index, has come down a lot. So this begs the case for rates to potentially continue to fall, absent maybe a reacceleration in growth, which again, we saw today with that ISM services number. It was kind of a wild ride in May. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the different data points that came out that kind of drove rates. Uh, it all started kind of at the beginning of the month after the Fed meeting. In early May, you, you had that weaker payrolls number that came in 175K versus 240K survey. Uh, in that same data point, that's when the first ISM services sub 50 for this cycle came out and that started the bond rally. You can see that continued until the day before CPI, you had a little bit of a sell-off. May 14th, you had a prices paid come out a little bit hotter than expected, but with the CPI number the next day on the 15th coming in, as expected, uh, and retail sales coming in weaker than expected, that led to a, a bond rally all the way down to about 430 on the 10 year. So we started the month up kind of 460 ish and got all the way down to 430. And, and almost every day after that CPI print it seemed like with the, the, the market sold off. So we sold back all the way up off to about that 460 level. And then we got more weak data to help fuel the rally started at the end of May, with uh, Q1 GDP revised lower, you got PCE coming in as expected. You had ISM manufacturing sub 50 yet again, weaker than the survey of 49 and a half came in at 48.7. And then just this, uh, just yesterday, we got some uh, job openings data uh, coming in lower than expected. I think the survey was about 8.3, 8.3 million, and it came in around eight. So. Job market continues to cool. Some parts of the economy continue to cool. Today was the that uh, ISM services that is is painting a rosier picture on the services economy, but again, that employment component of the, that ISM data helping the bond market to continue to rally. So I think we're going to run out of steam here at that 420 level on the 10-year. That was the previous ceiling. If you go back and look at trading ranges in the past, and that is now the new floor. So 420 on the 10-year. I think we're going to run out of steam. It's going to be hard to break down sub 4% unless we, we get weak, you know, much more weaker data to help corroborate the story. But here you can see the picture that's painted of the data really leading the way um, lower on rates. Now, while there is all this weak data out there, some things to keep into consideration, we've looked at some of this data from JP Morgan in the past about a reacceleration of global growth and what that could mean for a reacceleration of inflation. So maybe we flatline here and inflation and, and even perhaps go start moving up, which would be the risk. That's the, the, the tail risk is a, a reacceleration of inflation. So here you can see financial conditions. This is from Jim Reed and team at Deutsche Bank and financial conditions are in the, in the um, dark blue. And you can see that they've been improving obviously with the risk rally with credit spreads coming in. And this is laid on top with real final sales. So there is a correlation here and, and demand should start to increase. 
Um, and you're seeing that if you look at the real final sales to private domestic purchaser, that's starting to tick up again after being down. Here's also looking at financial conditions with manufacturing PMI. Manufacturing has been in a, in a, in a recession, frankly, for uh, almost two years, sub 50 for a long, long time. Uh, and there, this could potentially start rebounding as uh, companies that have put off capital purchases finally you know, start to have to invest into their business because maybe there is no recession. And you can also see that when you look at CapEx spending, CapEx spending is starting to uh, tick up again. That's in the dark blue. Future plans of CapEx, you can see again, it's starting to tick up again. And this is that story of as global growth reaccelerates and companies have to start reinvesting back into their businesses that perhaps that boosts CapEx spending, it brings manufacturing back into the green and that could maybe bring in some goods inflation. This shows you the different components of inflation. You've got housing in the bright blue at the top, uh, core services X shelter uh, or super core, I guess, in the uh, light blue. And then in the bottom is that core goods, which was what led inflation right after COVID with all the supply chain disruptions. And you can see that started to tick up again, not yet quite adding to inflation, but it's been moving upward. It's not disinflationary anymore. So that's one of those tail risks we've talked about in the past, still probably pretty low, but again, one of the things to, to, to look out for. The good news is this shows you supply chain pressure index with a four month lead, that's in the dark blue, and those supply chain pressures are definitely not there. So maybe we can see a reacceleration of manufacturing activity without necessarily seeing that spike in that core goods inflation. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the hope scenario out there. Another thing that is, I think, should be top of mind with the election coming up is immigration. Immigration, um, the lack of immigration is one of the things that caused the um, problems in the labor market as far as finding employees. Uh, we saw a, a, a stark drop in immigration and that led to you know, less people in the workforce. And we've seen an increase in immigration recently, which is helping to take some of that pressure off the jobs front. So if immigration policies are strict, that would be bad for inflation if immigration policies are a little bit looser and we're letting more, more potential employees coming into the, into the country, then that's going to help cool the labor market and that's going to help cool that services component of inflation. So even with this rally, we still don't have quite the crazy cut in rates that the market expected. This shows you the future Fed funds implied by the market. The red line is three months ago. You can see that was all the way down at 4.30 today. The market's thinking that the Fed's gonna cut a couple times down to, about two times down to uh, 4.80 area on Fed funds. But it was a great month for fixed income after a tough start to the year. You can see positive returns now across the board, especially in the higher quality, longer duration parts of the fixed income market over on the left that had lagged. Uh, you can see that investment grade corporate bonds almost up 2%, agency mortgages almost up 2%, the ag, almost up 1.7%. So bond funds that are actively managed that have a little bit more credit risk or, or have flipped positive for the year, the index is almost positive. Here you see that through uh, May 31st, the index was still negative 1.6, but we've seen continued rally in June and we're five days into June here. So many parts of fixed income now probably in the green and uh, positive returns after a rough start there. But spreads continue to compress. Here you can see year to date where we've seen the most spread compression. CMBS, triple Bs over on the left-hand side continuing to rally. Big rally in CLO, triple As playing catch up to the rest of the market. This is one of the themes we've been talking about is the securitized sectors playing catch up to corporate credit. And it's happening. It's, it's in action right now. In fact, uh, on the bottom left, CLO, triple As have joined investing grade corporate bonds and high yield in, in being in the expensive zone, sub 10 percentile, meaning, uh, for example, IG is now first percentile, only been more expensive, 1% of the trading days over the last 10 years. Uh, outside of AAA CLOs, the securitized sectors continue to look cheap up above. And again, the lone wolf top left agency mortgages. Well, it's done um, well recently. It is still not doing anywhere close to these other sectors. And it's one of the continues to be one of the cheaper sectors and we think will eventually play out uh, to play catch up towards the end of this year um, as, as the curve hopefully starts to steepen out a little bit, the Fed starts the cutting process and then banks and money managers more meaningfully come back into the marketplace.
These charts we've looked at for a while, this is a relative value of securitized versus corporates. The thesis being that these lines will eventually move down back to historical relationships. And you can see on the top right that CLOs have, they've now joined the land of gains uh, with spreads coming in dramatically over the last month. And uh, with that coming down, the next thing that should happen is these other sectors should play catch up, absent some idiosyncratic event in the marketplace that takes risk assets down. So if we're steady as she goes, kind of like we have been with, with volatility coming down, both on the on equity vol and rate vol, then these spread sectors will play catch up, continue to play catch up as we've been talking about here on Channel 11. Let's move on to the land of gains equities, the rocket ship now back up and to the right, stocks only go up, right? And it's got the happy face going because you know it's, it's the land of gains and everyone's making money, feeling pretty good. Um, in fact, we looked last month at some of these speculative parts of the market like Bitcoin and oil and cocoa beans, which had been on a tear and collapsed. And those speculative parts of the market have rebounded outside of oil. So a big rebound. Look at semiconductors. I mean, there are now new highs on semiconductors on the bottom right here. So it's an interesting market. It's the winners keep winning. This is uh, S&P 500 Infotech relative to the equal weighted, same basket, but equal weighted. And you can see it's some, the same high flyers keep leading the way. Uh, another way to look at it is take the S&P and break out the MAG7, MAG7 in the red, you know, leading the charge. You strip out the MAG7 and you got the blue, which is just struggling relative to the, the S&P index itself. So unfortunately the winners keep winning. And uh, if you're not long those winners, you're, you're doing okay, but you're not doing as good as that MAG7 and these high flyers out there. So as we look at the different indices across the globe, positive returns, EM and small caps lagging with Russell 2000 only up 3%, EM up only up 3%, uh, industrials lagging only up 4%, everything else up almost uh, high single digits, low double digits in Japan, that big winner up 16% for the Nikkei. Finally recovering after decades of being below the uh, early 90s high. Now looking at different sectors, you can see almost everything is positive real to date, real year to date except for real estate. And on the left hand side are the things that are up the most in May, which was tech utilities, which is uh, uh, interesting because utilities have the momentum right now, up 16% year to date momentum. You can see up 24% growth in consumer services. Um, energy also doing well, but kind of a flat month with what's going on with oil prices coming down and supply uh, coming from OPEC. Commodity performance, kind of a mixed bag with uh, again, energy down, but other com commodities recovering. So as a basket, the Goldman Sachs index with some heavier uh, energy weighting down on the month, but up on the year, up 10%. But here you can see that uh, commodities are definitely still off their highs for the year. So uh, up on the year, but off their highs on commodities. And last but not least, the dollar, um, the dollar weakening a little bit here following interest rates and but but being pretty stable and so here we see some pretty some pretty good stability off the highs but uh, you'll you need rates to fall more meaningfully in the US to get the dollar to come lower so we'll keep it short and sweet this week for channel 11 it was a good month for stocks good month for bonds and we're going to catch up at the end of the month with deputy CIO Jeff Sherman for a mid-year review here on channel 11.